Hi guys, happy Wednesday. Finally, we are going to be breaking down our overview of the Apocryphon of John. Again, if you would like to go deeper into these discussions regarding the missing gospels or the banned or heretical gospels from the Bible, then please join us on the Dark Outpost with David Zublick on Tuesday evenings. Otherwise, please sit back and enjoy this overview of the Apocryphon of John. Now, before we get started, I do want to apologize for any background noise that you may hear. There is a lot going on in the city today, and there's not a whole lot that I can do to get rid of the background noise. So I do apologize if it is inconvenient to you. Again, nothing I can do to stop it. I am right in the middle of Atlanta, Georgia. So just please bear with us as we go through this text. Another thing before we get into the Apocryphon of John, normally I would read through the text that we're studying, but I'm not gonna do that with the Apocryphon of John simply because the Apocryphon of John is a deeply, deeply, deeply spiritual book. And I feel like we can kind of give a synopsis of it without reading through it. Because it is so spiritual, I do encourage you, however, to read through the Apocryphon of John on your own. And once again, I would really like to thank all of my patrons for continuing to support this channel and support my work. If it were not for our patrons, we would not be able to do what we do. So again, thank you so much to all of you. If you would like to help support the channel, there is a link down in the description box below. So let's start to talk about the Apocryphon of John. Once again, I want to reiterate that when we talk about the Apoc Apocryphon of John or all the other missing Gospels, we do go deeper into the discussion on the Dark Outpost. There is a lot that I am limited to say on this platform. As you all know, us content creators on this platform do have a lot of boundaries and censorship has been amped up. So we have to be very, very, very careful about what we say. There was a lot that we discussed on the Dark Outpost that I am not going to be able to bring up in this episode. So I really do encourage you to go on over to that platform if you want to go deeper into this study. So the Apocryphon of John is also known as the Secret Revelation of John and the Secret Book of John. Apocryphon means secret teaching. By many scholars, this is also considered to be a continuation of the Gospel of John, as in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. I also want to note that with this Gospel, there are scholars who have spent their lifetime studying it. What we cover today will be a brief summary of ideas presented by scholars who focus on this gospel, the Gnostic Gospels, and Jewish mysticism. If you would like more resources to further your own dive into the subject, I will be more than happy to provide them to you. Some will be listed down in the description box below. This is by far one of the most misunderstood texts due to the crux of this text being one of Jewish mysticism. So mysticism comes from the word mystery or secret, and again, apocryphon means a secret teaching. The scholars that I used mainly for this research was Dr. Justin Sledge, Dr. Karen King, and Dr. Elaine Pagel. So first, let's review the history of this manuscript. So we know that there are four surviving manuscripts. One was purchased in Egypt in 1896. This is part of the Berlin Codex. Three copies were found in the Nag Hammadi Library in 1945. And I also want to note that of the four copies remaining, there are slight variations between each copy. Most of this is really insignificant, though. It's just things like Christ and Lord being interchangeable, but those are two words to describe the same person, so it doesn't change the actual context of the Gospels. 
Now, two copies were shorter than the others. The longer copies carried a list of demon names not found in the shorter copies. So basically, two copies, a more extended version with more names than the other two copies. All four copies were found most likely to be written in the 4th century. However, it is believed by scholars that the first copy of this gospel was written before 180 AD. So going back to look at early Christendom and the Apocryphon of John. So as stated by Dr. Elaine Pagel, when the Nag Hammadi Library was first discovered in 1945, scholars did not know what to do with it. Many scholars thought that the text was just weird. They knew that these books had been missing. They had heard of these books in other ch early church fathers' writings, but they had never actually seen these texts. And they are very, very, very different from what we know of the canonized Bible. So they were kind of la left scratching their heads a little bit. And it was Dr. Helmut Koster who was one of the first scholars to start to recognize patterns in the text that represented very early, unedited sayings of Jesus spoken about in the early Christian movement. He believed the Gospels of the Mag Hamadi Library held some of the earliest sources of Jesus' teaching, hypothesizing that they were written as early as 20 years after the death of Jesus. Our first book from the Nag Hammadi Library we studied on this show was the Gospel of Thomas. We will see some crossover from Thomas into the Apocryphon of John regarding imagery understood by ancient Jewish culture that of course would have then bled into early Christian culture. The Apocryphon of John is a Gnostic Gospel that historians believe was one of the most important Gospels to the early Christians. Why do scholars and historians believe this? Well, Dr. Justin Sledge says that only four remaining copies found might not seem like a lot to us today, but we have to take into context what we have remaining from antiquity. So we virtually have no remaining copies of the canonized Gospels, very few are left of the original copies of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And if we also look at other manuscripts like the Iliad and the Odyssey, more secular manuscripts, we have very little left of those original copies too. So if we put this into perspective, finding four copies is huge and points that this book was probably heavily circulated in early Christian communities. Following this lead also opens up a world of Jewish heritage, again that Jewish mysticism that existed in the early sect of Christianity that has been eradicated from our faith today. And going deeper into that topic again is something I can't go over on this platform, so please go over to the Dark Outpost because we do go deeper into that on David's platform. So Irenesis, we spoke about him on our last Gospel. If you can't remember a lot about him, then please refer back to last week's episode. I will include a list of all the past Gospels in this description box anyway, so you can just go down there and click the last, the last episode we did regarding the topics. And also, um, my last video on Friday over Polycarp, I talk a little bit about Irenesis in that episode as well, which I will also incl include a link to that in the description box for you too. Irenesis hated this gospel. He placed this gospel as heresy along with other Gnostic gospels, culminating in his life's work as a massive smear campaign against these gospels and the Christians who used them. So again, the early Gnostics did not call themselves Christians. That is a name that historians and scholars have given the Gnostics in order to separate them from the Orthodox faith, which was the faith that won out in the end to show the trajectory of what we know as Christianity to this day. But these Gnostics did not call themselves Gnostics. Again, they were simply Christians. The thing that Irenesis hated about these Gospels was that they were teaching sayings or um, secret teachings, again, apocryphons, and this idea that Jesus taught his disciples secret knowledge or esoteric mystery. Irenesis rejected this idea he wanted the Christian faith to be unified under one controlled t 
teaching. So Irenesis was of that whole idea of secrets, secrets are no fun. Secrets are for everyone. He didn't like the idea that there were disciples, apostles who had had private interactions with Jesus. He claimed it was heresy to believe Jesus gave his disciples special teachings. However, his claim that secret teachings never happened between Jesus and his disciples is debunked by the book of Mark, the canonized book of Mark. We find this in Mark 4, 11 through 12. It says, he told them, the secret of the kingdom of God has given to you, but to those on the outside, everything is said in parables so that they may be ever seeing but never perceiving and ever hearing but never understanding. Otherwise, they might turn and be forgiven. So we know from here, he's saying that on the outside to the outer world, Jesus taught the general public through parables. But with his disciples, he taught them one-on-one -on -one with different or more in-depth knowledge. Before the discovery of the lost gospels, we had the parables teachings found in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, but not the secret teachings as Mark does not say what these secret teachings were in his gospels. Scholars believe the lost gospels were never supposed to replace any gospels, but merely supplement them. The only two secret teachings or apocryphon teachings we see in the Bible are from Paul and John who wrote Revelation. Now many Christians believe that the John who wrote Revelation is the same John as in the Gospel of John and as in this Apocryphon of John, whereas there are other Christians and scholars who believe that John who wrote Revelation is um, or was a different person altogether. We do know that the Apocryphon of John and the Gospel of John are the same John though. In my opinion, doesn't really matter. Doesn't matter who, who wrote Revelation, in my opinion. It's the message that, that matters. So things we need to know in Greek. So edio is to know from exterior sight. So intellectual understanding is edio. Everything you learn in school, two plus two is four. That's edio. People, when they have multiple degrees, a PhD, doctorate, masters, whatever, their undergrad, that's edio. That's intellectual understanding. But gnosis is inner knowledge, like the Gnostic, the inner knowing. That's heart understanding. Now, during this time, it was believed that edio, or intellectual understanding, was the elementary level of understanding. It was the lowest common denominator. I myself know a lot of people who are very prideful and egotistical about the amount of degrees that they have. And in having all those degrees from schools, they lack no inner knowledge. They're book smart. They're not street smart. And here we see that being book smart is the lowest common denominator. It's elementary. It's the beginning. But having gnosis, having inner knowledge, that's the supreme form of knowledge. Now, gnosis the beginnings of Gnosis can be taught to, to somebody to start to contemplate different philosophies. However, to achieve Gnosis is something that the person has to achieve themselves. So the orthodox belief of Christianity, they only wanted the edio. They only wanted the intellectual knowledge. They didn't want the Gnosis. Early Christian theology, however, had both edio and Gnosis. The canonized Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, again, hold that edio, that elementary understanding. The band Gospels carry then the Gnosis. So the canonized Gospel give us knowledge of Jesus. Who was Jesus? Where did he come from? What did he look like? X, Y, and Z. So we understand that intellectual knowledge, that edio of who Jesus was. But the next step in this faith back in early Christendom was then understanding who we are. Who are you? And this is where the Gnostic Gospels come in. 
So Dr. Elaine Pagel brought up the idea that Irenesis was not necessarily against the Gnostic Gospels, even though he wrote about them as being heresy and tried to get rid of them. She believes that Irenesis was convicted in his beliefs in getting rid of the Gnostic texts because of persecution. Again, I will insert our video on Polycarp that we did on Friday to understand a little bit more about what was going on to Christians during that time. Irenesis, again, was a Greek bishop who was a missionary in France, then it was called Gaul. He had seen his teacher Polycarp burned alive at the stake. So for Irenesis, protection was necessary. Dr. Elaine Pagel even brings up the whole saying, we either hang separate or hang together. He was trying to unify the faith in order to make the faith stronger in order to protect the people being persecuted. Possibly he had PTSD. We know that PTSD or trauma responses causes people to do things and say things and believe things that under normal circumstances they probably would not do, say, or believe. So in that perspective, I guess we can have a little bit of um, compassion for Irenesis that he was just literally living in trauma. And of course, back then they didn't understand post-traumatic stress disorder or anything like that, but we understand that more now. So after the Council of Nicaea in the 4th century, this was one of the books that could get you burned at the stake for owning. This cracks me up. It all, it, in a very cynical way, it cracks me up because we never saw Jesus burn anybody at the stake. But once Christianity was or became a state religion under Constantine, y'all know how I feel about Constantine. Constantine was not a saint. He was a psychopath. The history books are wrong. The controlled narrative given to us by the government, by the church, is wrong. Constantine was awful. Um, but the fact that they would then go and fight wars over this, it tells you right there they weren't practicing a Christian faith because Jesus didn't hurt anybody. But even though you could be burned at the stake for owning this book, or reading this book, or teaching this book, scholars believe this book was still heavily used into the 8th century, so the 700s, by Christians. That just shows you again how important this book was to the original Christian people. So within this book, as we talked about in the Gospel of Judas, we get into Sethian theology and Jewish mysticism. So the Sethian theology is a more extended version of the Genesis story, the creation story, and that's what we see a lot with the Apocryphon of John. And I find this very, very fascinating. And as I said on the Dark Outpost, at this point in my own faith, I'm not taking an opinion on the Sethian theology. I just find it very interesting and very fascinating and something very important for us to look at and review because this Sethian theology used to be a part of our own faith. It used to be taught in the Christian churches. So in order for us to understand where Christianity came from and how it evolved, we need to know this stuff. Regardless of as we accept it as fact or not, we still need to know it. So let's start by looking at Genesis 4.25 from the canonized Bible. And Adam knew his wife again, and she bore a son, and called his name Seth. For God hath anointed me another seed instead of Abel, for Cain slew him. So according to Jewish heritage, Seth was born to Adam and Eve after Abel was murdered. Eve believed Seth had been anointed by God to replace Abel. It is through Seth's bloodline that we have Enoch and Noah. Now, my original intention was to go through all the Sethian banned books in order. However, I think we need to jump into the Old Testament next week to start looking at the book of Jubilee. This is because we will get a more detailed understanding of Seth's story and the Sethian theology. Jubilee was also banned by Constantine for being heretical. Jubilee was banned even though Jesus does reference it. And we'll get more into that, Jesus' references of Jubilee, when we actually look into the book of Jubilee. So according to the Sethian theology, Seth is the grandfather of passing on knowledge of the true God, so the Gnosis. The Sethian story is part of Jewish heritage. It is really important to understand moving forward 
The early Christians would have been familiar with the Genesis story as it relates to the complexity of man's fall. We also have to acknowledge the Council of Nicaea. We're trying to purify the faith by basically scrubbing the majority of the heritage from it. The disciples, as well as Jesus, would have grown up with this particular creation story. And we'll see this in the Apocryphon of John. Jesus is a huge part of the Sethian creation story. And that's all I'm really going to say on that. Again, that whole issue, if you know what I mean, I can't talk about on YouTube, sadly, because of censorship. So again, please, please, please go to the Dark Outpost if you want to hear more about the scrubbing or the purifying of the Christian faith, if you know what I'm talking about. I also want to point out that we only find the Jewish mystical teachings in the sources that the church calls heresy. In my opinion, this is something that every Christian needs to consider when studying these texts. My mother used to tell us all the time that the Jewish people were God's chosen people and it was our job to always protect them. So the fact that this faith was scrubbed and purified from this says a lot to me about these Canaanites who now run the church and have run the church since the fourth century. We also have to remember the Catholic Church, especially the Catholic Church role in World War II. Which side did the Catholic Church support? And I'll let you do that research yourself. So again, this is why we cannot, absolutely cannot believe something is heresy just because someone tells you it, it is. Okay, there is a deep, complex, and dark history here with the founding of the official church. In my opinion, the removing of this text isn't to protect anyone but the bloodline families that control the church today. There is more to this story than meets the eye. In my opinion as well, seminary schools are dirty. They're corrupt. So even if your pastor, your preacher is a good person, they've probably been taught some pretty horrific things. And that's been happening for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. So if anything 2020 has taught us, this great, great awakening has taught us, we can take nothing at face value. Even things I tell you, do not take at face value. You are a sovereign being with free will and a consciousness and awareness. You need to go and research all of this for yourself. Do not take anybody else's word for it. Do not take your preacher's word for it. Do not take my word for it. Do not take scholars' word for it research for yourself. Go deeper into your own understanding. So there are themes to understand in this text. And these are certain themes that I took from uh, Dr. Karen King from a lecture, which I will post that lecture in the description box below for you if you want to go deeper into this. So we understand that this is a very complex text that revealed teachings from the Savior or Jesus to his student John after Jesus' death. Written to teach readers to be alert of hidden messages and meanings in scripture. So basically to read between the lines. It was written to expose the deceptions of the lower world rulers. It was also used to separate people into two groups. Those who understood or had gnosis and those who did not understand. Those who did not understand were still under the deception or the spells of the demonic rulers. We can see this in our own society today. We have those who get it, those who are awake. Most of you on this channel get it. You understand that everything we see now is an illusion, that we're leaving. Humanity is now leaving the matrix, the matrix that was designed by lower world rulers like Lucifer, all right? And those who do not understand, those who sit at home and watch mainstream media all day, those people are still an EDO or elementary understanding and they are still under the deception of the demonic rulers. This text also talks about God's true nature being a mystery, which I've talked about a lot in my own opinion. We cannot understand who God is because we are human. 
God is beyond humanity. God is something without a beginning, a middle, an end, a birth, a life, or a death. Therefore, our own mortal minds cannot possibly understand God. And one of the mistakes that we make when we fall short of God is when we put human opinions and personality traits onto God when God is not human. This also exposes the true names of the enemy. Again, I told you in some of the longer versions of the Apocryphon of John, we do have a list of demon names. The true names of all these lower world rulers have been hidden from the masses for a reason. For example, we're going to see the name of Satan is Yeldabaoth. Yeldabaoth is his real name. In spiritual war wars, strategies of concealment are used by both sides. We see this today in The Art of War, which is a book that was written that's being used by the White Hats to this day and by Mr. T, number 45, President number 45, he is using The Art of War. This text also teaches the practice of silence, that silence is golden. It shows an incredible amount of God's compassion to humanity. It teaches that the world is a place of shadow ruled by evil beings, and this text exposes their lies, and that their lies are a violation of God's plans. Again, we see the idea with the cure, quote unquote, quote unquote, the cure, the V word, the cure for the beer bug, right? We see this coercion to force people to get this cure. When the main rule of the cosmos is free will, you cannot, you cannot break free will. So we know that's why we know it's not going to work because you can't break free will. All right, this also offers knowledge of one's true nature as part of the light, not a part of the world of chaos. We also learn that man is made in the image of the divine and the body is made by the lower world rulers. The body was created to enslave man to the lower world so the lower world could harvest man's divine spark. So let me explain that again that our natural state, our bodies, our world, was created by Yeldabaoth. But where it says we were created in God's image, that's not our body. That's our spirit, our divine spark, our consciousness. In fact, in the Hebrew text, in the Bible where it says, and God said, let there be light. Back in the early days, the Hebrew-speaking people would have understood that word light as being divine spark, not light as in the sun, but that divine spark, that soul that lives in both human beings and animals, the light behind somebody's eyes, that is where we are created in God's image. According to Dr. Karen King, this Apocryphon of John is the first full Christian story. Themes of the text, this again comes from Dr. Karen King, is Christ's revelation of God in the divine world and the origins of the universe and humanity, the nature of evil and suffering, the body, the path to salvation, and the final end to all things. So with that being said, I'm going to give you a bit of a brief summary of this story. I'm not going to read it again. I would really like for you to read it for yourself. The story itself is way more complex than the words on the paper. There's a lot to talk about. Once again, I will put links down in the description box to hear more scholars talk about this. There is also different perceptions taught by different scholars. So not even scholars agree on everything talked about in this gospel. So again, this is just a brief brief very brief synopsis of the story of the Apocryphon of John. The most important theme, I believe, for us right now in this moment studying this gospel is to understand or start to understand the complexity of the creation story and the Sethian theology. If you are interested, I do read through the Apocryphon of John again on the Dark Outpost. If you want to hear it read through and talked about from the text itself, once more, please go and visit that 
platform on Tuesday night so you can get here a deeper discussion on these banned Gospels. So the Apocryphon of John starts off with Jesus' disciple John going to the temple. This is after, again, after Jesus has been crucified and ascended up into heaven. And he's mocked by a Pharisee at the temple for following Jesus. And then John runs off into the mountainside to have a little pity party. Of course, he's heartbroken. He's sad. His world has been turned upside down, kind of having a woe is me moment or probably more appropriate to say a come to Jesus moment because then Jesus appears to him. And Jesus appears to him in a great light. At first, John doesn't recognize that it's Jesus, but then he realizes it's Jesus. And Jesus tells John that Jesus is going to tell John the whole truth of our creation. The first part of his speech, he's talking about God, that the idea of God is boundless, that there is no words in human vocabulary to even describe what God is, that we can't even use words like perfect or divine because even those words themselves mean nothing compared to the majesty of God. He then goes on to say that God is able to create on himself. He can co-create within himself. So he expands his own self, God's own self, to create a female counterpart. So the yin and the yang of male and female. This then is called Barbello. And we talked about the Barbello from the Gospel of Judas. This was also mentioned in the Gospel of the Holy Twelve, where Jesus referred to God as Father Mother. That Father Mother, that light, is Barbello. In fact, in the Apocryphon of John, there is a quote that says, Her light reflects his light. It is a perfect unity. From the Barbello, and of course I'm skipping over a bunch of stuff because this is a brief overview, but from this Barbello, that's where we get the creation of the Son, or the Christ. At this point, it's not called Jesus because Jesus' name only comes into play when Jesus takes human form as a man. But the Son is then created from the unity of Father, Mother, or Barbello. And we saw in the Gospel of the Holy Twelve where, where they would like chastise Jesus, the Pharisees, saying like, you are not even old enough. How do you say that you're wiser than Abraham or Moses? And Jesus would say, I'm far older than there. I've been here. I've been around longer than Abraham and Moses. And this is where we get that from, that Jesus' spirit, his soul, was already in existence before humanity was even here on this earth. Throughout the Apocryphon of John, we go through a huge creation of the cosmos or the cosmology. We see the creation of different angels that have different names, different lights that are coming from the Barbello family, as it were. We also see the first Genesis story where there is a creation of Adam, of an Adam, in the sky. Think what you will about that. Aliens, extraterrestrials, angels, who knows? It doesn't really specify in the text. I think that's up to every individual person's own opinion. Well, then one of the lights that come out of this family, one of these angels, these lights, her name is Sophia. And Sophia is the name for wisdom. She is the angel of wisdom. But in this wisdom, she has ignorance where she starts to procreate within herself. And doing this, she creates an entity called Yeldabaoth. Okay, so she did not have the permission of God to create from herself, but she did it anyway in ignorance. Wisdom and ignorance creates Yeldabaoth. Well, Yeldabaoth has a slight divinity to him, even though he was not created by God. Yeldabaoth then falls down into the lower realms because he was not created by God. Yeldabaoth then thinks he is the only God. Sophia eventually sees the mistakes she's made, and she goes back and asks for forgiveness, and God forgives gives her and welcomes her back into his, his kingdom. But we have Yeldabaoth here, who then tries to create to an inversion, a mockery of the cosmology that God had created. In doing so, he creates man, Adam. A-D-A-M, 
the one that's in the, this is where we pick up from the Genesis story in the Bible. See how much was taken out of the Bible? Now we're starting with the Bible. But this, this Adam that he creates is, is lifeless. Because Yeldabaoth doesn't understand how to create how God creates. He can't give the divine spark. He only has his own divine spark from his mother, Sophia. He cannot give it to other people because he is not God. He is not of the light. And so at this point, God sends some of his entourage down to have a little chit-chat with Yeldabaoth. And backing up a little bit, in the creation of ADAM, of that Adam with Yeldabaoth, it goes into grave detail about how Yeldabaoth has 365 demons under him that he can help create these people to serve him. So he created this, this man to look like the, the, the atoms, the genesis of the cosmos to now serve Yeldabaoth or Satan. Okay. But he cannot, again, give a divine spark. So God sends, he sees these poor creatures, this Adam that has no life that Yeldabaoth has now created. And so God decides to step in and he sends his his entourage, his angels, to go down there and have a little chit-chat with Yeldabaoth. Well, in doing so, they trick Yeldabaoth into breathing his divine spark from his mother Sophia, from wisdom, into Adam. So Yeldabaoth does that and basically gives up his divinity at that point and replaces that with Adam. So now Adam, as in Adam and Eve, is more divine and is more powerful then Yeldabaoth, okay, it was all a trick, a trickery from God. So now this body, these natural bodies that we are in, that were once totally dominated by demonic forces, are now luminous with the light. Now this again is a very, very, very brief breakdown of the Apocryphon of John. It goes into a whole lot more detail about this whole battle. But we start to understand where the issue lies as human beings in our own creation. Since Yeldabaoth mistakenly gave us his divinity, he's now trying to keep us enslaved in the bodies that he created in order to harvest that divinity for himself. This is the battle between good and evil, God and Satan, or God and Yeldabaoth. It's all for that divine spark. We see this with harvesting ceremonies that certain Canaanite families still do to this day. You want to play for the dark side, you're going to have to give to the dark side. The dark side doesn't give without getting in return. The dark side can't give without getting in return. God doesn't ask for anything in return. God gives. So when Jesus came down to earth, Jesus had already made the decision to come down to earth to be in Jesus' body. To explain this to human beings, this gnosis that your body, even though it illuminates now because there is a divine spark within it that is consciousness, that is divine, that is God, that belongs to God, your body is still a body in a world of chaos created by Yeldabaoth, by Satan. Again, the Gnostics knew this. The Gnostics knew who they were, where they came from, and where they were going. They knew they weren't their body. They knew they weren't their identities. They knew that divine spark within them was the thing that was eternal and was the salvation of God. I mean, think about that. In this story, Adam was created by Eldabeth, and, and God just could have left it. He could have just like left this lifeless body with no soul down on earth to be Eldabeth's slave for eternity, but he stepped in and gave us divinity. And then he stepped in and Jesus came down and gave his body to try to make another deal to release humanity. Now, regardless of whether you believe this story is a legitimate story or a metaphor, an analogy of what's really going on, again, doesn't really matter at this point to me. What matters is that we are valuable. We are so valuable that the underworld rulers don't want us to know how valuable we are. Because if we knew, we would fight back. If we knew just how special we were, we wouldn't let them push us around the way that they have. But the most beautiful thing about today's world is that we are starting to wake up. We are finding these lost gospels. We are starting to understand this a little bit more. 
even in the practice of yoga, we know that our purusha, our soul, is what's eternal, not our prakriti, or our nature. And anybody who is of any type of faith that's of the light, I think we need to be reminded that from time to time that we don't belong to this world. Jesus even said that his kingdom is not of this world. And I think it's pretty cool, regardless of whether this is accurate or not. Again, I don't really have an opinion on the accuracy of this or not. It's just interesting. The Sethian theology, this idea that this son that replaced Abel through Adam, that was given the divine spark of life through God, and Cain, who had chosen through his actual mother Lilith to serve Lucifer, the Canaanites, the Israelites, and through Seth, we are still living that freedom in our divine spark. So that's where we're going to leave it today with the Apocryphon of John. Again, please, please, please go read this for yourself. Again, if you want to hear me read through it with David Zublick, follow the link in the description box below. Again, the next band gospel, our book, it's not a gospel, we will be covering will be the Book of Jubilee, which is also called Little Genesis, in order to get an even deeper understanding in the Sethian theology before we return back to the Gospels that are involved in this Sethian theology, just so we have, I have a better understanding, you have a better understanding. And if you did grow up Jewish, or if you did grow up with this Sethian heritage, I would love to hear from you about what you know about what you heard growing up, because we absolutely did not grow up with this in the Presbyterian church. And I'm assuming in a lot of other churches, no one was taught this story. So I'd love to hear your story as well. I hope you guys are having a fantastic week. So much is going on now in our lives. The best truly is yet to come. Thank you so much to Josh McKay for doing our music. And thank you again to Todd Roderick for helping me get this out to you guys. And I will talk to you soon. Bye.